Hey, thanks for being a part of the conversation. Let's do some pod crashing. Episode number 221 is with Joel Stein from the podcast Story of the Week. I'm doing okay. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get it off my chest right away. If you want to hang up afterwards, Please. you're more than welcome to. Uh, I'm I, gonna. I think that you have taken Paul Harvey's The Rest of the Story to the next level. Well, I don't know how I hang up on that. I, I'd be pretty ple- pleased if I took Paul Harvey's show to the level below. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm just starting out at this. Yeah. Unbelievable. The connection that, I mean, it's like an instant connection because I'm drawn into your stories because you have this amazing ability of knowing where my next thought is going to be. And it's, and I, I, it's like you're a visionary. Well, uh, sort of, but also I like talk to someone for two hours and we cut it down to a half hour which is how one appears to be a visionary. Well, how, how do you handle those situations? Because I've done that where I've invited people into the studio and they go, there's, there's only like 30 minutes here of me. What will we, we talk that I'm not getting that time back. Sorry, man. It's the producer in me that took over. Yeah. Well, I, there's a producer who actually takes over. So there's, there are producers on this podcast who, uh, who yell at me and, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm doing these interviews with these journalists who write these really long, complicated stories. They took six months to report. So they've got so – I asked them to tell me their stories, and they have so much to tell me because they've written these, like, 15-page stories, and then some of what they wrote got cut. Mm-hmm. So they have these really complicated, interesting stories, and uh, I do it, like many podcasters, in my closet over Zoom, <laughs> and so uh, – which my wife makes fun of me for in, in I think, homophobic ways. But, um, yeah, so I'm, uh, I, I'm here, and the producer is in the chat part of uh, Zoom telling me to move on and stop asking all these questions. So, oh my yeah, God. we try and keep it moving. Oh, my God. That reminds me so much of when I when I did television. That IFB, man, my producer back in the studio would say, you're, oh. not, you're not listening to the conversation. Get it off you and get it on them. <laughs> well, I was worried I was going to be Albert Brooks in broadcast news and not be able to do that. Because I'm a print journalist. Like, what I do is sit for hours with people with a physical notebook and just, like, wait for interesting things to be said that I can write down. So... Yeah, I, I thought I'd just be a sweaty mess as someone tried to talk to me as I talked to someone else. Did you get used to that? Uh, I did. I did. It was only because then all of a sudden I started trusting their direction. And and so so in the early days of television and stuff like that, I was, you know, everybody, you know, carries their little notebooks around to look official and all that kind of stuff. And so that's when I started listening. And, and the thing is, is that's when you start questioning their answers. When you're listening. but When you're listening. It's, but it's the trick, of course that Albert Brooks couldn't hack and William Hurt could was to be listening to someone and really listening uh, while someone talks in your ear. Right. That, I mean, that's that's challenging. Yeah, that's that's very difficult to do. It really is. Yeah. And, the, you know, the, the thing about your show, for, for instance, let's put some focus on the billionaires that are preparing for the final days. Building bunkers. That's our first episode. Yeah. Oh, my God. I, I was like, I, and I, I was, it was one of those I knew it moments because it's, I, cause you, you can't help but look at the world today and go, where's everybody going to go? Well, the question is, where are the billionaires going to go? And you And you provide that for us. Yeah, we have this guy I've known for a long time. And that's a fun thing. I've been a magazine writer for 20-something years. So I know a bunch of these people who write these much better stories than I do. And one of them is Douglas Rushkoff. And he had written a story uh, and originally for Medium. But it was such a great story because he had been paid a ton of money, more than he'd ever been paid, $40,000 to give a speech. So he flies out to some hotel. And Douglas writes about the internet and he calls himself a futurist and he's been doing this for a long time and he's prepared a speech and he goes to the green room to get mic'd and instead five guys walk in, some of whom are billionaires, all of whom are very rich and they just want to talk to him Mm. for an hour. So there's no speech. And the thing they want to talk to him about is where to build their bunker. Mm-hmm. And they've all like hired Navy SEALs to protect them (laughs) for something they call the event. And the event for each of them is something different, but it's some, you know, it could be nuclear war, it could be massive climate change, it could be the robots taking over, but they're all waiting for some end of the world event. And they've, they've built these very, uh, you know, beautiful, you know, luxury bunkers, which, which is so crazy. Wow. You're so perfect for podcasting in the way that when you do the research on, on the creation of podcasts, it was because of writers that brought it forward. They just wanted to get their voices and their stories heard. And so, so when you say that you came from print, I'm going, of course you're in a podcast. Of course you are. This, this, you are the true roots of what we're doing. It is. I still love writing so much, but mm-hmm. I, I will say 
uh, it's a lot easier to get people to listen to a podcast. I was at the Hollywood Bowl last night and uh, someone I knew saw me and yelled, I love your new podcast. Uh, at which point I said, you could be talking to anyone at the Hollywood Bowl right now. I don't know if you mean me. Uh, at which point he yelled to the whole bowl, hey, everybody, I love your new podcast. But <laughs> but yeah, I don't think anyone's yelled to me in, in public that they loved my article in quite a while. Yeah. So it, the lift is a lot lower to get someone to listen to a podcast. I love the jingle. Who Who does that? Is that you? No, I have no musical talent, but I know this guy, Jonathan Colton, who writes really funny, smart songs uh, like Code Monkey that you may have heard. <laughs> and, uh, and I told him to write, you know, it's a really simple idea for a show, which is uh, we find a story in a magazine uh, that's really long and complicated, and we get the person to come on the show and tell us their story. <clears throat> it's a, That's a somewhat difficult thing to explain, so I asked Jonathan can you do what Sherwood Schwartz did for the guy who created and wrote the theme songs for Gilligan's Island and the Brady Bunch. He did such a great job of explaining the premise and the song that by the time you got to the show, you didn't have to figure anything out. So I asked him to do that with a theme song and he just nailed it. What are you going to do when, when people say that they get their news from you? And, 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 I, and I mean that as a compliment because, I mean, you know, like the Daily Show and stuff like that. People tune into the Daily Show to get their news. And, and, and with the way that you deliver this news, dude, this is very, very addictive to listen to it. Well, I want to tell them it's not news. Like, we're purposely not picking anything that has to do with the doom scrolling you do on your phone. Right. So there's nothing that you – these are stories you're not finding in on – CNN or, you know, the New York Times, uh, wherever you get your news, this is not a front page story. This is a weird story. Yep. This is a, compl a complicated story. This is a story with turns and twists you don't expect. It's like a story. It's not a piece of news that makes you angry. It's a piece of uh, hu human life that makes you empathetic towards other people because you realize how crazy and unexpected and weird the world is so um so yeah you, you will not you'll get the kind of news our goal is you're going to get a story that you're going to need to tell the next three people you run into i mean um, but you're not you're not going to get a story that's just going to make you you know angry at somebody well you know you're you're, you're gonna laugh as well so it's almost it's almost like infotainment then because we were listening to the story with allison who spent 10 years on tinder i mean how how did you go into this conversation without you know to, to keep to keep away from the creepiness that, that it's like because sometimes when you sit down with people with tinder you, you want to ask every dang question i asked every dang <laughs> question and, and i have i purposely asked for a young female now i'm, now I'm saying creepier i simply <laughs> I, I purposely asked for a producer who was uh young and female so she could tell me when i get creepy okay. and she did and so she was like you said when you had that uh, piece in your ear she was telling me to back off and more importantly you know i talked to someone for an hour and a half two hours we cut it down to a half hour so there's plenty of me being creepy that was cut you know what? What is your theory behind the half hour? Because I mean, that my you know, I, I when when I go into and I see a show that's you know like sixty minutes or ninety minutes or a Joe Rogan five days. Yeah, I mean, it's like it's like I can't I can't take all of that in. So how did you settle in on thirty minutes? You know, I I kind of like those shows, those like Dax Shepherds or oh, yeah. um, Sam Harris, where they really get into it with someone. And I, that's what I pitched to this company podcast. Uh, pushkin that malcolm gladwell owns and so i they're the ones who kind of set me straight and they said no no one wants to do that no listener wants to to spend that much time with you maybe yeah. with joe rogan but not you yeah because so they, they cut me to a half hour yeah, because everything that I've ever learned, it's like, you know, each town, no matter how big the town is, you're only 20 minutes away from something. And so, and it's like, okay, that's that's what we have to do. We, ha we have to figure out how we're going to take that 20 minutes and put sound in it. I wish they had said it to me that way. That's really smart. That's a, that's your average commute, right? It's yeah. a little, it's about, about 20? About 20 minutes, yep. Oh, well, yeah, we, so we're not doing a great job. We come in close to 30. <laughs> yeah, but you keep us in the car, though. Dude, I sat there in the car, and, and, and you know, when, when you were talking about toad poisons and stuff like that, I wasn't going to leave until, because I kept looking at the counter going, oh, my God, there's only three more minutes left. You can do this. You can do this. That's the highest compliment I've gotten so far on this podcast. That's amazing. 
Uh, and yeah, it's probably due to the uh, the doctor who administers uh, toad poison for people to smoke in Mexico uh, <laughs> and all over the world. He travels all over the world. He's the high priestess of smoking toad, and a couple <laughs> people have died in his care. Mm. Uh, but that that guy, that story, that's from the New Yorker. I thought that was an amazing story. Oh, I'm so. I hope it didn't, you know, your doctor's appointment wasn't canceled, but I'm glad you stayed in the car. Oh, I I'm, appreciate I'm, that. I'm a time freak. I get places. I always believe that three hours early is six hours too late. Oh, my God. You know, you know what changed me? I, in the first book I wrote, I did uh, three days of boot camp in the Army. And my captain said to all of us, there's no, you're not, you're never, you're never on time. There's no such thing. You're either early or late and you never want to be late. And it just stuck with me that like, yeah. It, and now even Zooms, I'm on, I Zoomed an interview with George Clooney during the pandemic and I logged on five minutes early and he was already there. Yep. 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 I love that stuff. I, I, I noticed that a lot about the rock stars too, because it's not that they want to hurry up and get the interview over. They just want to make sure that, that, you know, they're on time and, and, you know, we're, we're, we're going to have a, a, a good vibe. It's amazing how uh, professional successful people are even rock stars yeah yeah it's it's such a business but the, the one thing and i don't know if you're uh, starting to feel this as well since the pandemic do, do you notice that everybody is is more grateful for having an opportunity that's a good question have you noticed that i have i have the people that would not have talked before are saying yeah let's do it let's do it i'm going really are you sure <laughs> i mean wow wow how's this going to happen are they just desperate for human interaction, or do you think they're more grateful? Um, no, I feel it. I because when when I go into a conversation, we're breaking down lyrics and stuff like that with these, especially with these new bands, and and you know because and maybe it's the teaching of the group Tesla because Tesla has really adopted this idea of we're going to go out there into the real world, grab these musicians, and we're going to train them because nobody is doing it, and I and I just love the members of Tesla for doing that. I had no idea that's what Tesla did. Yeah, yeah, and they they have they have they, they take them into the studio. They teach them about the marketing because that's how they. And then I get a hold of them is because you know they they're going to be interviewed. They're, it's not going to be a, you know a groupie or anybody like that asking the questions. It's going to be somebody who takes it very seriously. I love looking into lyrics. Yeah, oh my you know, god! As, oh, like Song Exploder. Mm -hmm. I just can't because I grew up at a time in which you you know you had. If you were lucky, the album came with lyrics, but it didn't always. And it was often, and I didn't, and you're a teenager, and so you don't even know much about the world in these references. I was sitting next to someone, I saw The Who last night at the Hollywood Bowl. I was sitting, and there were a surprising amount of young people there. Mm -hmm. And the guy next to me was rocking out really hard, and he was acting out a lot, a lot of The Who songs. But he, uh, they were singing um, You Better You Bet, and they got to the part about listening to you know, the sound of old T-Rex, and he impersonated a dinosaur. <laughs> and I was like, oh, right. Why would this guy know who T-Rex is? Um, <laughs> yeah, but I love, oh, you know, ever since li Rap Genius or Lyric Genius or whatever it's called now, it's so, which isn't as good as I want it to be, but it's still at least a peek into what, what, pe what, what these songs mean. It's so... I'm fascinated. You're right about the younger generation adopting the, the older music because last night Fathom Events did a Grateful Dead concert, 90 minutes of the concert, and the majority of the people, two sold out theaters, two of them, were, were young people. Wait, I don't understand. Who was playing? Fathom Events. It was the Grateful Dead. They played, they played an old concert that went 90 minutes. Well, I don't know what Fathom Events is. What it is, is you go to AMC or you go to a Regal Theater, and they all have all of these events. You can, you can go and, and you, oh, you can like see the- Oh, like they do with opera. With, yeah, exactly. Like, and, they, and they're doing uh, it with concerts now. And it's, a, it's such a moment to experience. What is- I, I'm old enough where I used to see the Grateful Dead, the Shoreline Amphitheater. Uh, what is a Grateful Dead concert on a movie screen like? That sounds like- the but, opposite of what a Grateful Dead concert would, is like. But the thing is, though, I've even done it with Kanye West, and you're sitting there going, "I have to watch Kanye West up on the on the the IMAX screen." You get so involved and so into it that you're dancing, you're singing. People don't sit in their seats; they get up and dance. That's amazing. Yeah, I guess that works. I, I, Kanye makes more sense to me than the Dead because the Dead concert was like only ten percent about seeing the Dead; like mm -hmm. it was all about the experience. But um. 
I, I, I kind of want to go do that now and check it out. Yeah, it, and and they came dressed, dude. I mean, it was it was like what? Being, yes. Oh my god. Like cosplay dressed, like dressed as if they were in the seventies. Oh yes. Oh yes. And 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 it was so. It was like walking into you know what you know what the 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 uh, Volkswagen City looks like. Did you ever go to one of those where where the whole entire community comes together before the show and they're living there in their tents and everything? Oh, and the veggie hot dogs. Yeah, I've done that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, it kind of reminded me of that. It's it was like a big gathering. Wow, that and and this was what? Where were you? Where was that? I was I was at Regal Stonecrest, and so and so, but Regal as well as AMC, they'll they'll do these Fathom event concerts, and I mean Def Leppard, Bon Jovi. I, I mean, in fact, I'll never forget the one that I did with the Jonas Brothers, and the Jonas Brothers were actually there. They came into the theater with me. Oh, that's cool. Well, that seems like a waste. Why not just <laughs> the Jonas Brothers are there? Why not just listen to the Jonas Brothers? I don't know. I'm worried about our culture. This doesn't seem right. So, so back to the podcast story of the week. When do you know that you've bumped into the next episode? Well, we. I'm working for this uh, Malcolm Gladwell's company, so there's. Uh, it's very bureaucratic. We have lots of meetings and lots of emails where we discuss why a story may or may not work. We have a spreadsheet. Uh, which you know, I'm not. I'm not made for spreadsheets. But we have uh, <laughs> we we discuss like pros and cons of each of these stories, and I'm looking for something that is very complicated and has twists that surprise you. It doesn't just go where you think it's going to go. Uh, not not a big fan of murder because mm-hmm. I you know I do I wind up making jokes with the person, so I don't want to do it. So it's something too dark. But um, you know, some of these stories are are a little more dark like we have one coming out oh the one coming out tomorrow i liked a lot and it, uh do you know what larping is no live action role playing it's it's normally when like instead of playing dungeons and dragons you get too into it and you get a foam sword and you go out in the woods dressed like an elf and you beat up some wizard <laughs> so um th- that became popular like 20 years ago or uh, popular is not fair it became done about 20 years ago and it turns out in Scandinavian countries, they LARP, and it's become incredibly popular there. And there's like a LARP-themed uh, high school. It, it's like a big thing in the community, but they LARP incredibly dark things, like they'll LARP um, the AIDS crisis in the 80s, mm. or being in a bunker after a nuclear war if the you know Cuban Missile Crisis had gone badly. So this guy is in Denmark, American guy visiting, and he does a LARP and it's fake gay conversion therapy. Wow. And and he thinks it's, he's gay, but he thinks it's gonna be kind of interesting and fun. And instead he gets kind of wrapped up in it and he gets really emotional and he kind of hates himself because he's getting wrapped up emotionally in this thing, which is a little, you know, inherently silly. And it's a, it's a pretty crazy story. Man, you know, it reminds me of of this this new flick that I've been I've been watching or this new binge watch, and and it's called Midnight Club. And what they do is the the goal is to tell a scary story, and and the characters act it out. So it, that's got to be why this this it, LARPing. That that is that's got to be the the next big thing. Oh, so this is a reality show this no, this, it's this, this, this it, it's definitely scripted but what happens is is that it's a midnight club and so they they're all people that that are that are dying that's the darkness part of it but they they all oh. meet in this room to have a drink and then someone has to um, they sit at the front of the table and tell a story share a story but it has to be a dark deep scary story and and the people that are playing the the the, the roles are those that are sitting in the room they're they're playing it out oh that's a fun idea yeah yeah it's it's very similar but but that's the kind of story. That's the kind of what we're doing is we're we're sitting around and having someone tell a story. Yeah. You know, the original idea for the podcast was when I first got to New York, I'd go to these obnoxious parties and someone would walk up to me and they would say, "Did you read the story? The story in the New Yorker?" And I would say yes, even though I hadn't. <laughs> and then they and then they would tell me the whole story, even though I just told them I read it. And um, <laughs> so instead of having the boring guy at the party tell you this incredible story. We are having the person that wrote the story and spent months reporting this come and tell us the story. And then I'm hoping that you then go to some party and bore people with your retelling of it. I love it. That That's that's it, the continuation. That, that's a Dolly Partonism. You know, that's the way that they did country music up there in the Appalachians. Wait, what? Dolly Parton. She she told me that that the way that they the reason what they they did things in music in the Appalachians was because if Johnny died over here at this farm, it had to get over to this city. And so they did it in music. 
That's how they spread well, that's their news. How every, every culture did. I mean, that's the, the the Odyssey was told, you know, over a loot over the campfire until, uh, you know, it was put. It was eventually written down. But yeah, most most oral traditions are people sitting around singing stories because that's the only way you can remember it. If it rhymes and has, you know, music, you remember songs. Yeah. Like that, that that's the way to tell a story. Yeah, because uh, that's why we have a theme song. Even even in the uh, the new movie Banshee, which is from Colin Farrell, there's a woman in there that makes you just laugh every time she you come into her store. What's this, what's the news? What's the news? What's the news? And and it's like and see and that's what I I gotta tell you that I thought of your podcast because now when I tune into it on iHeart, it's I really do. What's the news? And I know you, it's not a news story, but it's still news to me. It's content. Yeah, it's a story. It's a story you want to tell people. Yeah. I mean, if we did our job right, it, you, you, as soon as you finish it, you have to tell someone you, you heard this crazy story. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God, Joel, I could talk to you all dang day. You got to come back so we can do more of this. Yeah, I want to talk about song lyrics with you. Yeah, oh, I'll do it. I'll, we can get some of these musicians right. and break them down, dude. <laughs> I love that so much. <laughs> well, you be brilliant right, today, if okay? if you read a crazy story... What's that? If you, if you read a crazy story, e- email me. I'll do it. If you, if you if you're reading something that you think is a makes a story of the week, let me know. I'll do it. I'll do it. You be brilliant today, okay, sir? Oh, uh, you too. Thank you so much.